Bingo, we're back, four o'clock rock. We're calling this discussion Threads of Hawaii. The implication is that we're gonna talk about threads of history in Hawaii with Ray Tsuchiyama, who is an informed citizen and joins us for discussions like this uh, today. And we're gonna find the essence and the evolution of this place, really important. Um, today we're talking about um, finding a plan, weaving a plan uh, after statehood, I guess. But, but we will range far and wide, won't we, Ray? We're going to look at the, the whole enchilada all the time about how this place, you know, was started. Uh, what, what is actually happening under the hood? Where do you want to start today, Ray? Well, uh, you mentioned a good uh, question, an issue. Uh, what is Hawaii? and uh, where it is going, and uh, has it ever really evolved to a state where we would be quite happy that we have reached the state or, or what we want Hawaii to be. And when you go back in time, of course, uh, Hawaii uh, grew out of a dream under the king, the first king, uh, Kamehameha the Great, who unified the islands as <coughs> one kingdom. And that has propelled us uh, throughout the 19th century. And then we became a republic and a territory. And even when it was a territory in the late 30s, the territory of Hawaii government was planning a lot, going, uh, looking in the future, what would Hawaii be? But it was derailed by Pearl Harbor <laughs> yeah, right. and, and the years of martial law. And then it started up again in the 40s and 50s. Let me ask you, can you paint a picture for us the day before Pearl Harbor? What was this place like then? Well, it was uh, in population quite smaller. It was like uh, uh, maybe 200,000 people or, or fewer. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, if you broke down the population back then, it was highly Japanese. Uh, even Maui was maybe 40% Japanese in terms of, of residents. Um, it had uh, uh, people working for one of the big five companies, uh, at Castle and Cook or Amfac or, uh, 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 or TOH uh, Davies or, or C. Brewer, one of those big, big companies. Very few sm small, uh, um, uh, small uh, companies back then, and people lived outside the city. They were in camps, <coughs> like my uh, father was uh, living in Pune in a camp in Maui. Mm -hmm. There were many camps in Haleiwa, Waipahu. People were uh, segregated more or less but they were integrated, uh, working together in, in the fields. They would come back. Uh, and there were, uh, there were a lot of families, Chinese, uh, uh, Japanese, uh, and so forth, that had larger families back then. And uh, five, six children were, uh, were the norm in, in those days. A couple of things. Yeah. And the families were not necessarily in one place. Sometimes they were scattered among the islands, isn't it true? That's true. Uh, and, and there were, say for uh, on Maui, they would have relatives on Lanai and Molokai. Yeah, yeah. I, I would have, uh, 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 a lot Why more. was that? Was it because the jobs were there and you went where the jobs were? And were there jobs in Honolulu? Or if not, was that why people were not coming to Honolulu? Well, uh, I think Honolulu was just evolving as a, as a city. Uh, of course, it had uh, Pearl Harbor, a uh, uh, very big uh, base. It had Schofield Barracks. It had Bishop Street, of course, uh, the ba major banks were there. It was a very beautiful tropical uh, kind of uh, capital uh, headquarters of, mm -hmm. of all the big five companies. And the University of Hawaii, of course, uh, which was uh, growing. And, and so there, there was uh, some manufacturing also, Kakaako, uh, what used to be, you know, Mapuno. You know, all these areas would have uh, small uh, uh, factories turning out a lot of things and, and um, repairing machinery for the plantation, you know, uh, uh, sugar and, and pineapple. So it, w it was a uh, kind of a small city. When you think about it, uh, west of uh, Red Hill was just fields <laughs> on Oahu. And it was a small, concentrated uh, community. And it was served by uh, uh, a, a, a small system of, of what we would call trolleys. There were trolleys going to uh, the Elks Club near Diamond Head. There were trolleys going on Manoa. There were trolleys going on Wailea Avenue, which, uh, which was Kaimuki. Kaimuki right? was a fabulous neighborhood in those days. Mm -hmm. There were, and uh, oddly enough, uh, uh, by coincidence, there was a spur that went to the western part of Honolulu called Fort Chapter, 
which is very <laughs> near Middle Street. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and that uh, concentration of people who, you know, worked at Fort Shafter and, and, and the military. So the military was quite large in those days before mm -hmm. the war. Uh, there was a, uh, you know, Hawaiian division in Schofield and Fort Shafter and, of course, Pearl Harbor. And you could see all the ships lined up at, at uh, uh, all the battleships and so forth. So, uh, and, and uh, River Street, of course, had a very substantial Japanese presence. A lot of Japanese hotels. Uh, uh, restaurants, uh, uh, bookstores. Uh, there was a whole kind of ecosystem of Japanese, you know, and Chinese and other uh, life, plus a, a uh, rollicking uh, small uh, hotel street in Chinatown catering to the military. Yeah, but the people weren't coming off the neighbor islands so quickly. They were, they didn't have the opportunity, oh, the no. incentive to move to Honolulu. They couldn't necessarily find work. They stayed on the neighbor islands in the plantations with their families. Um, they lived, it was like they lived in remote locations rather than in the center of Correct. the state. Correct. And, and uh, you, 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 we could use a word that may or may not fit, but what we are referring to is feudalism. <laughs> 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 You're completely right. You were, you were constricted in time and space and travel. Uh, there were uh, you know, uh, plantations in Hana, for example, or Kohala, or, or Molokai, way out on Kauai. I mean, they were distributed uh, throughout the islands, w and they had to be near the fields. You're absolutely right. And so you couldn't, uh, there were contracts, and you had, uh, you had to fill out your contracts. So you were uh, more or less tied to, to the kind of plantation. It, it w there was no freedom to move, and, and even if you came to Honolulu, you had to find a job, and uh, there weren't many in, in Honolulu uh, at that time. Yeah, so, and, uh, and the know, power, the political power, and the economic power was divided on racial lines, wasn't Correct. it? Correct. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 until after the war, the Republican Party, of course, uh, uh, held uh, sway. And um, now, now the racial lines are very complicated because, as you recall, there were many Hawaiians who voted uh, Republican. Uh, yes. Prince, Prince Kuhio was, yes. uh, at his, uh, was part of this. But, and and um, so they were um, uh, and in voting. Who could vote? U.S. citizens voted. Remember, there were laws against my grandparents becoming citizens and so forth. So uh, the number of registered voters was quite small and, and quite controlled. And, uh, and, and the um, uh, jobs at a big five firm, uh, you, up till maybe as late as the late 60s or early 70s, it was very difficult for non-Caucasian to even you know, go, go and apply at a big five firm. You, you have to remember, 1968, a year before the Apollo moon landing, was when the Pacific Club opened its doors. That's scary to think about <laughs> 1968. Yeah. That, yeah, that was yeah, a time yeah. of Woodstock occurred a year later. And the yeah. Beatles, I mean, this is very uh, much a time so close to us, but th they were trying to hold on. But remember, again, as we uh, began this conversation, Honolulu was a very small town. Uh, in the, even in the mid-60s, there was a book called Men and Women of Honolulu, and you could you knew everybody in, in that book. Uh, the police, the courts, uh, the press, uh, the Starbolt and everything were very much a part of a whole uh, other other ecosystem that we don't recognize. And now. the great population was out in the plantations. That's, That's right. where most of the people were. That's right. Can you describe life on the plantations in those days, say, before the war? Well, uh, you know, I could hark back to my uh, father, my uncles and aunts, and, uh, and, and um, uh, uh, grandparents, and um, my grandmother worked at a uh, plantation manager's house. She baked pies, and it was really, uh, she, she, I didn't know her uh, until she um, uh, later was uh, much older, but so is, they lived in a plantation house. And there was a plantation hospital. There was a, everything was, was there. There was a plantation store. Uh, so, but the thing that I wanted to also say is that my father and others of that generation, remember there were many children back then, not, not the small families that we have now in Honolulu, urban Honolulu. They went to what I feel very good schools. Uh, in my father graduated from Maui High School in 37. They had uh, Shakespearean plays. His best friend was called Cassius from Julius Caesar. They had proms. They had newspapers. They were learning English at an English standard level. Uh, when he went to, uh, uh, and, and why I'm uh, pointing this out is that so when you see the 442nd evolving as a military unit in the 40s, they already knew how to communicate in English, to read and write, do math, and, and do trigonometry for artillery. So they were the basis of real Americans. And their teachers came from uh, Michigan, from Stanford, from all over the US, great uh, colleges, because they saw in Hawaii a grand experiment. 
as John Dewey said, to m create real Americans. And that's what we would say a Peace Corps today. They were there in, on Kauai, the island of Hawaii, and Maui. And, and it must have been Hawaii. a sweet life then, in a way. I know it's hard to work on a plantation, and you're missing a lot of creature comforts you'd like to have, and you're under sort of a controlled environment. But still, there was a certain closeness, a certain... The, the, the nostalgia isn't right. only nostalgia. There was real value back then. I, I think that if you speak to people of that time, uh, they would say they never locked their doors. They also had radios. They could listen to what was happening on the mainland and, uh, and, and all kinds of uh, CBS and you know, the radio RKO of that time. They could also listen to Japanese radio coming in. My father and uncle had cars in the, in the late 30s. They were driving around. Uh, this, is, this is 50 years before China and Vietnam and you know, all India, all these countries that we see as developing nations. My, uh, they were, uh, uh, they were uh, going all over the place in, in cars. And uh, my father uh, was a manager of a baseball team from uh, Maui High School. And they took the ferry every month or a couple of weeks to the Honolulu. The steamer. Yeah, they used to come to Honolulu and see the bright lights. And, and, but there was a connection because when you look at uh, Wailuku Kahului, that was like an urban little center yeah. of life uh, that connected with Honolulu. And there were uh, Japanese radio stations, Japanese newspapers. It was a very um, culturally very advanced place when you uh, go back in time. And it was unique in these United States. Oh, it was, it was a, like I said, a grand experiment trying to uh, create a, a new American uh, because my grandparents spoke no English yeah. and their children, my uh, father's generation, all became very adept in English, even far uh, more than Japanese. Uh, so uh, when the war began, of course, that, that would shatter uh, uh, a lot of people's uh, dreams about, you know, uh, living a, a Japanese life all in Hawaii. Yeah, the war would have a profound effect on the, on the environment you described in the day before Pearl Harbor. What, what, it, what, it, you know, what effect did it have? First of all, it, it, it led to those camps, and it must have led to some kind of discrimination on the street. Uh, some kind of stress in the society that wasn't there before? I think it was profound stress for everybody in different ways. Now, for example, my uh, grandmother, who spoke no English, uh, could not speak Japanese outside the house because that would be, uh, a sp she was a spy, uh, in a sense. <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, her, uh, and that gave power to English-speaking children when you think about ah, it. They, yeah, they, they yeah. began to navigate the, uh, the hospitals. Uh, but remember also the, uh, the neighbor islands is, was much more controlled, the, those societies, through uh, the courts and police and, and the plantations than Honolulu. If you lived in a, uh, near McKinley or neighborhoods and so forth, uh, you were, you were uh, living an urban life rather than on a plantation. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the stories is that my uncle had beautiful swords, and, and he, uh, after Pearl Harbor, he wrapped them in newspaper, hurriedly dug a hole, and then buried them <laughs> after the war. Of course, they were, all rust, they were all rusted through. Oh, too bad. And we lost everything. So there were a lot of stories how uh, people would hide evidence that they were ever connected with Japan. Yeah. And uh, that would, uh, from the 40s and 50s and onward, the 60s, th that would uh, uh, also um, uh, usher in a decline in Japanese language and culture. Yeah. So the war changes everything. And when uh, the 442nd and the 100th Battalion come back from the war, it's different. And it has a political effect within only a few years because they were war heroes. And because it's time, it's their time. It was their time, Dan and Owe and all that. And they became prominent in Hawaii politics. And by the time of statehood in 1959, um, there was some pretty interesting things happening in politics. And things were like coming together, but maybe not in the way that we would idealize. There were wrinkles in all of that. And when we come back, when we come back from this break, Ray, I want to talk about the planning that existed prior to statehood and how it changed after statehood. That's Ray Tsuchiyama. He's an informed citizen on Threads of Hawaii, and we're finding the essence and evolution of this place, and we're weaving, we're, we're talking about weaving plans after statehood. Join us at Think Tech of Hawaii. Our show is Asia in Review. Our next program is on November 17th. This is Johnson Choi, your host. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. 
You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha. See you then. Hi, I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'd love you to join us every week, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. for Ehana Kako. Let's work together. We report every week on the good things going on in our state, as well as the better things that can go on in the future. We have guests covering everything from the economy, the government, and society. See you Mondays on Ehana Kako at 2 o'clock p.m. Until then, I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. We're back. We're live. We're talking about the evolution and essence of this place. We're talking about threads, historical threads in Hawaii with Ray Tsuchiyama, an informed citizen and more. So here we are. We're approaching statehood. Things are getting pretty exciting. Things are changing. People are coming to Honolulu now. Um, and it's so interesting that even at that time, in the emancipation, the political emancipation following World War II, the plantations are beginning to decline. Everything is changing. So how does that reflect itself in the level and quality of planning that was going on? When statehood uh, began or was launched in 1959, the people of that time were quite young. Daniel Inouye was barely in his early 30s. Mm. Uh, Patsy Mink, of mm. course, uh, uh, finished high school in the mid-40s. And, and, and there was you know, people like uh, uh, Nadao Yoshinaga and others, and, and uh, Talao Beppu, and, and, and many neighbor island people especially, because the neighbor islands felt the pain more than Honolulu. They wanted accelerated e economic development much more than, uh, than Honolulu. In fact, uh, some of them still rankle, especially on Maui, that uh, Maui is the only neighbor island uh, th uh, uh, that proposed Lahaina as the capital of Hawaii, as I say to Hawaii. <laughs> but think about that. They were even, even you know, going ahead at that period. Now, you have a good uh, point. How did, if I, the, if I was there in 1959, what were people thinking about or planning or talking about in the street, of course? And of course, they were talking about new opportunities, especially in Honolulu. They, uh, they saw that uh, in, in um, the sky, uh, what was coming up when they read the newspapers, a plane called the 707. They they, right, the same year, wasn't yes, it? Yes, 707 could, could carry hundreds of passengers and could come to uh, Honolulu and disgorge hundreds of passengers at that point. Before, it took a ship, you know, a week or more to come to, from L.A. Uh, or San Francisco. And these were very high heel people who would stay at the Royal Hawaii for one month. Now you could have people who could stay for one week and then leave for California. Uh, and of course, the Ilikai uh, on the Chin Ho was the great symbol of a uh, of a hotel that was not un that was totally unlike the uh, Royal Hawaiian or Moana, the slow kind of pre-war uh, 30s kind of Hawaii. This was uh, built for short-term in and out kind of uh, tourism, and uh, all the infrastructure for the in and out tourism, the, the um, uh, all the tiki dolls and all the uh, you know all kinds of uh, omiyage we call uh, you know uh, things to bring back to your presence began to evolve in Waikiki and all kinds of short-term rentals and all short-term yeah, rentals uh, yeah. that that we began My to change represented yes. those short-term rentals and in the late rentals. late forties of course that's a boom time uh, of a uh, of a man who saw the future Roy Kelly he began to buy up hotels also to create a new empire called the Outrigger yeah and uh, and so uh, they saw tourism coming out and all the things to um, uh, support the tourism infrastructure restaurants uh, and fine dining and all kinds of things began to uh, uh, pop up the canvases and you know uh, all the uh, the the um, uh, all kinds of um, uh, little restaurants began to come up uh, cheaper places too so there was a uh, really a, a, a change but also I remember in 6061 is the start of the Vietnam War the early 60s and uh, that began to push through a lot of soldiers uh, the strategic importance of UH and the East West Center began to uh, happen so a lot of threats uh, uh, planning wise began to occur at the same time uh, the impact of strategic uh, importance of Hawaii plus tourism 
occurred almost simultaneously with the decline of uh, everything agriculture. Everything was changing. Uh, right. Everything. So, so Governor Burns, uh, uh, of course, was there, but he was surrounded by young people who came out of the war and and uh, saw the, the world. They went to uh, you know, the South. They went saw New York. They saw Europe. Came back and said, "Wow!" Or Japan with the MIS and began saying, "Wow, th we can change Hawaii in many ways." And and in early '60s comes a, a, a new office for planning and economic development. Um, and that was under uh, Professor Shelley Marks from the uh, Department of Economics at UH. And so This was the first time. That's right, the first let, time. Let me go back for a moment. Statehood. Was statehood uh, an initiative desired by the Young Turk po po you know, political group uh, with Dan and Owe? Or was it desired by the Big Five? I would imagine the Big Five would like status quo at that time, and the Young Turks would like to see statehood. But tell me how it worked. Uh, the, you're exactly right. And uh, remember, uh, governors and so forth were appointed <laughs> back then. Right. Quinn was uh, the governor. Quinn was the last right. appointed governor uh, of that era, and so forth. So every time you had a Republican governor, uh, 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 Mr. I'm sorry, president like Eisenhower, he yeah. was appointed a Republican, and that was good for the Big Five. Uh, uh, and so Republicans uh, ruled the uh, House, uh, the Senate, and also the newspapers. They were all entrenched. There was a very uh, controlled. Uh, so state. there wasn't a lot of planning going on in that period. Status quo. Let's do status quo. And then only, only after statehood do we get to John Burns and we get to the initial Department of, of Economic Development. There was some planning in the late 30s on the territory of Hawaii, but, but like I say, uh, said earlier, it was derailed by the war. Mm. And, uh, and really, the, after, uh, and during the war, it was um, on the martial law. There was not much planning or anything going on uh, in Hawaii. Uh, now, looking back at that time, uh, you, you're correct that the status quo would, uh, would like a controlled society, a plantation, kind of agrarian, kind of uh, uh, feudal system you know, uh, sustaining itself. And, um, uh, and what was odd about all this was that they did not realize the impact of education public education. So I'm going back in time and saying the 30s and 40s into the 50s, public education really churned out people who did not want to work at the plantation. Mm. They had uh, expectations of a life uh, working in an air-conditioned office. That was the ideal kind of job. And so they looked at all kinds of new areas where they could take this research or information, science-based. I, mean, uh, I mean, think about uh, all these uh, new um, uh, jobs and, and, and job creation of that time. It's not dissimilar to, the, to today. <laughs> yeah, and the university became more important. And the university, uh, we have heard in so many discussions, was um, um, a hotbed, if you will. That's correct. In the in, late 60s? In early, early in, uh, throughout the 60s, uh, especially under Tom Hamilton, uh, President Hamilton for uh, Hamilton Library is named after, he was in uh, Honolulu uh, at UH for only five or six years, a very short time. But he came in and said something was quite unusual uh, at that time. He said that he wanted to bring UH up to the level of a Berkeley or Michigan, uh, many good uh, uh, public uh, state universities on the mainland. Uh, in English, engineering, sciences, uh, comparative literature, and, and so forth, the, the basics. Uh, he was going after the core curriculum of that period. And so if you uh, went to UH during the 60s, you had a very good education. And there were a lot of faculty, again, coming in from uh, the mainland, younger people, uh, with the Vietnam War. And uh, of course, it was a, 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 it was a, a top place to study about Asia, Asian mm -hmm. languages mm -hmm. and culture mm -hmm. and history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, including East West Center. That's right. At that it was time. there. That's right. But you know what? What I get is that everything was changing. Uh, the state now had the ability to do some planning, um, but it didn't. I mean, for when, when John Burns was there, it, he sounded like he was a positive influence and all that, and to a certain extent, uh, George Arioni Oshi after him. But it seemed to be so many things changing. It was like running away with itself. It's very hard to plan effectively when your society is running away with, it, with itself. And I'm reminded of a lesson that I learned the day I arrived here, which was October 1965, that islands and the society of islands are much different than the society of continents. And this, this, these islands were way different 
and the, you know everything was different in the way people act and react the way political structures social structures work so many things were changing that nobody could get a handle on how to plan for them comment well, uh, well when you think about talk about planning uh in a uh, in a democracy in an america in a free market capitalist society the free uh, it should figure itself out when you think about it <laughs> adam automatically smith, yeah or adam smith that you know the uh, or uh, on the reagan you know uh, a rising tide uh, you know, ra uh, raises all boats and when you talk about planning and about you know plans uh, i'm uh, you know you are i'm reminded of the you know 10 year 20 year soviet or chinese communist planning or <laughs> india planning or all that and then uh, it fell apart. I mean, uh, government, uh, or or even Brazil, uh, and uh, they had all kinds of plans. But uh, you had to compete in the in the marketplace to win. Brazil did something that uh, people now look back on as, as, the, as a disaster. They tried to develop their high tech uh, industry by uh, banning imports. So all you had was uh, things developed in Brazil that was second or third rate. And then that uh, completely disrupted uh, the Brazilian, you know, high tech economy and you so know, forth. Free market. That's right. That's right. So, but uh, going back to the '60s, yes, uh, they were planning ahead, but you had a um, uh, economy that was basically running on a paradigm of pre-war Hawaii. <laughs> and and that was going on and providing jobs, but you had new growth though in tourism, yes, uh, uh, dramatic uh, and and military, yeah. and uh, something else that we see in effect today, which is the growth of the state government. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, as an industry, uh, yeah, that's it's very large. <laughs> if you total up county, state, and federal, uh, you know, uh, employment, it's over twenty percent, uh, probably even more. And that's one out of four when you think about a workforce. And if you compare that to Nevada, Oregon, Arizona, no, it's, it's quite half or even a third. And this, and this has had a profound effect on the development of the state that we have government that is so large proportionately. That, well, it, 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 nobody expected that at that time. But also going back in time, it, it, you had to provide for jobs for people with expectations, with very good education coming out of UH, all through the 50s and 60s, and they, uh, they didn't want to work in uh, sugar or pineapple. So uh, it was a growth uh, industry, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, of that period, but it, it was a natural effect. But th there's another thing that happened also that I just wanted to uh, 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 add that we don't really um, uh, see uh, but invisible to us is the 80s and 90s into the 2000s, about 70 to 80,000 people from Hawaii are now living in Clark County, Nevada. That's about 8% of the population, 7 to 8%. And, and that was a safety valve of people who left uh, uh, for Nevada, which has a parallel economy in tourism and uh, hospitality. Uh, and, but if they had remained, I think uh, the Hawaii economy would have had more difficulties and challenges over yes, the last yes. 20 years. Ray, this is so interesting. I wish we had more. <laughs> well, we will have more time. We'll do this again. I mean, it's, it's sort of wandering through the, right. the, the path of yesteryear, finding the essence and evolution of, of Hawaii, uh, finding threads in Hawaii with uh, uh, Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, a, a, an informed citizen. I really love to have this discussion. We'll do it. Promise me we'll do it again. Okay, we'll do it. Thank you, Ray.